Good morning. I'm Brian Curtis. And I'm Doug Krisner. Here are the stories we're following today. All right, now it's time for Global News. The U.S. is expressing concern on multiple fronts today about potential spread of the war in the Middle East. Ed Baxter is covering that as part of the Middle East story and has all of his reporting from San Francisco. Ed. All right. Thank you, Brian. Right. uh, U.S. ratcheting up efforts to keep the Middle East war from spreading. Secretary of State Antony Blinken will extend his trip further and go back to Israel. What I've heard from virtually every partner was a determination, a shared view that we have to do everything possible to make sure this doesn't spread to other places. And says Gaza civilians should not suffer. As I said in Tel Aviv, as President Biden has said, the way that Israel does this matters. Uh, Needs to do it in a way that affirms uh, the shared values that we have for human life and human dignity. And meanwhile, the U.S. is confirming at least 30 U.S. citizens are confirmed dead in the violence. About a million people have been told to evacuate northern Gaza, meanwhile, ahead of an expected Israeli assault on Hamas. An Israeli Defense Forces spokesman, Lieutenant Colonel Peter Lerner, says Hamas is trying to prevent uh, the safe evacuation of people. They established checkpoints to try and prevent people. They disseminated messaging telling people to ignore that. Ignore that. And it just goes to show how Hamas is actually trying to put the people of Gaza at more risk. And White House National Security Advisor Jake Sullivan on ABC has heard on Bloomberg says U.S. is trying to get aid into Gaza. We are in touch with our Israeli counterparts. We're in touch with the United Nations to help secure the necessary supplies of food, water and medicine. Uh, to the citizens of Gaza, those Palestinians who have nothing to do with the barbaric terrorists who carried out this attack. Meanwhile, Hezbollah has attacked Israeli army positions near the border with Lebanon. uh, uh, Iran-backed Hezbollah has fired guided missiles again at the post and also destroyed a tank with live ammunition. Meanwhile, a bipartisan group of U.S. lawmakers is in Israel, and Senate Majority Leader Chuck Schumer says an aid package is on the way. We're not waiting for the House, plain and simple. That would be foolish. But we believe if we put together a strong package and pass it with an overwhelming strong bipartisan majority, it will put pressure on the House one way or another yeah, so so nothing, they're not waiting for the House is his bottom line. Meanwhile, the House will attempt to elect a speaker on Tuesday. Members notified today the vote will occur. The Republican caucus has nominated Jim Jordan for the job. Whether or not he has the support to get it done is still a question. Meanwhile, House Majority Le- Minority Leader Hakeem Jeffries says he's in informal talks with Republican colleagues about a potential solution to finding a speaker. Jeffries on NBC, as heard here on Bloomberg, says Democrats Democrats are ready, willing, and able to find a solution. There are informal conversations that have been underway when we get back to Washington tomorrow. It's important to begin to formalize those discussions. Uh, so then it'll wait for House Republicans and for uh, Chuck Schumer to get back. Philippines have asked China to stop dangerous maneuvers and aggressive actions in the South China Sea. It is warning a potential collision of the disputed waters. Philippine military says it had to send warnings to Chinese ships to avoid danger. Global News, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in over 120 countries. In San Francisco, I'm Ed Baxter, and this is Bloomberg. Yeah, thanks very much. This is Bloomberg Daybreak Asia. I'm Brian Curtis, along with Doug Krisner. Our colleague Paul Allen will join us a little later. Well, Israel is hoping to avoid a debt rating cut as investors eye the impact of this war with Hamas. We get the story from Bloomberg's Denise Pellegrini. A top Israeli official in charge of the country's debt says Israel might be able to avoid its first ever rating downgrade thanks to sound finances. The senior official at the finance ministry does say, however, that all bets would be off if the country's war drags out for a long time. The official also calls a credit downgrade an extreme scenario and says it would be more likely Israel would be put on credit watch. The cost to insure Israeli bonds against potential default did soar last week to the highest point in a decade, but Moody's Investor Service Friday postponed a planned review of Israel's rating and said it would continue to evaluate instead. Denise Pellegrini, Bloomberg Radio. The head of the World Trade Organization is warning that war between Israel and Hamas will have a big impact on global trade if the conflict were to spread. More from Bloomberg Steve Rappaport. WTO Director General Ngozi Okonjo-Awela says the war will only further weaken global trade, already crippled by high interest rates, China's stressed real estate market, and Russia's war with Ukraine. 
Dr. Okonjo Awela says she hopes the conflict ends soon and it's contained, adding everybody's on eggshells and hoping for the best. The WTO last week cut its growth forecast for global goods trade this year. Steve Rappaport, Bloomberg Radio. U.S. Secretary of State Anthony Blinken has urged China to use its influence in the Israel-Hamas conflict. Bloomberg's Joanne Wong has the story from Hong Kong. The U.S. State Department says Blinken had a long conversation with Foreign Minister Wang Yi before departing from Riyadh. The two spoke for about an hour. It was their first call since the Hamas attacks on Israel a week ago. Blinken urged Beijing to help prevent other state or non-state actors from attacking Israel and widening the war. The U.S. has been particularly concerned about Hezbollah, the Iran-backed militia group in Lebanon. The administration is worried about an additional front being opened on Israel's northern border. In Hong Kong, I'm Joanne Wang Bloomberg. Radio. We go to China next, where the central bank is saying now that the domestic economy and the property market are showing signs of improvement. We have more from Bloomberg's Baniao in Hong Kong. Central Bank Chief Pan Gongsheng said indicators including industrial production and surfaces showed positive trends in the economy. He spoke at the IMF meetings in Morocco. Pan also said China's local government debt risk is structural and generally manageable. He said China would step up efforts to attract foreign investment and stabilize trade, but he was not specific about the details. Pan said China would seek more sustainable growth while maintaining what he called a reasonable pace of expansion. In Hong Kong, I'm Bonnie Ao, Bloomberg Radio. Back in the United States, Wall Street will have plenty to contend with this week, not only the geopolitics we've been talking about, but also a flood of earnings reports coming. We get more from Bloomberg's Charlie Pellet. Among the financials this week, Goldman Sachs, Morgan Stanley, Bank of America, Blackstone, Bank of New York Mellon, American Express, and Charles Schwab. We'll also hear from a broad range of S&P companies. Sarah Malik is Chief Investment Officer at Nuveen. Coming into earnings season, we've seen cuts to consensus. I think there's upside companies can beat and raise. Also, er, margins are expected to be down. And we're coming off three quarters of an earnings recession of negative, negative earnings growth. Also this week, AT and t Johnson & Johnson, Lockheed Martin, Netflix, and Tesla, among many others. In New York, Charlie Pellet, Bloomberg Radio. All right, the time here is about 10 minutes past the hour, and we are looking at some of the top stories here with our guest, Benjamin Anthony, co-founder and CEO of the Miriam Institute, to talk a little bit more about the Israel-Hamas war. Paul Allen from Sydney joins us for the conversation as well. Uh, Benjamin, thanks very much. I guess pressing here at the moment is these more than half a million Gazans that have moved to the south uh, of Gaza. And yet, at the same time, we don't know yet whether or not the border with Egypt uh, uh, will be open for uh, supplies. Uh, So that could develop into a humanitarian crisis. Uh, How urgent is that? And can you flesh out some of the um, some of the behind the scenes actions on that? Yes, absolutely. And thank you for having me. The situation with the Gazans who are moving southward is a result of the IDF's efforts to reduce to its lowest number the civilian casualties that will be caught in the crossfire in the event of a ground incursion. Now, it's important to emphasize a ground incursion has not yet taken place. We are beyond a week since the attack last Saturday upon the civilians of the states of Israel that resulted in 1,300 members of our society here being massacred in the most horrendous and horrific manner, and more than 150 being taken as hostages still being held, including our elderly, our infirm, our women, our children, even unborn children, it's reported to be the case. And as a consequence of that, the IDF seeks to now clear out northern Gaza of Hamas fighters with a view, a stated view, to toppling the Hamas military regime. With that in mind, they have called repeatedly and at length for Gazans to move by way of a humanitarian corridor signed by the Israel Defense Forces down to the south toward the Rafir crossing. And they have also called upon the Egyptians to open the border if the need arises. Now, with that having been said, there is a movement of people down toward the south. That is a positive development. Israel has turned on the water supply and gas supply in southern Gaza as a result of the influx of those individuals and of those people. But it's very possible that Hamas is cynically holding others, and it seems to be the case, in northern Gaza with a view to causing deliberately civilian casualties in the event of what seems to be an inevitable ground incursion. But there are still many questions to be asked about that. 
We have been hearing uh, some pretty hot rhetoric come from uh, Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu in terms of wiping Hamas off the map. So what does Gaza look like at the end of this conflict? And there is, is there a risk for Israel here in terms of the scale of its retaliation? I think that there's always a risk. War is one of those things that one only gets a retaliation upon contact, right? And everybody has a very clear strategy until there is engagement with the enemy. The reality of the matter is that for years, Prime Minister Netanyahu, despite the fiery rhetoric, has decided upon a cautious approach towards toppling, fighting, countering Hamas operatives inside the Gaza Strip. I don't refer to the toppling of the Hamas movement because obviously that was not achieved. But the targeted killings of leaders of Hamas, that's something that Netanyahu has been very measured with in the past. Now, what's interesting about this is he's formed a war cabinet, which includes members of the opposition, including former defense minister and chief of staff Benny Gantz and another former chief of staff of the Israel Defense Forces, Gadi Eisenkot. Now, fascinatingly, all three of these individuals have worked before with regard to the Gaza Front, and at, on all occasions, they have adopted a cautious, measured approach. So to move from that approach to an approach that would match the rhetoric you mentioned of Prime Minister Netanyahu, which alludes to the toppling of Hamas, that's going to take a dramatic shift in mindset and strategy. We'll wait and see whether that occurs. One interesting aspect at play, there is a new individual, the Defence Minister Yoav Gallant, a true combat fighter of the Israel Defence Forces, formerly the head of our Naval Commando yeah. Unit in the Israeli Navy. And he may be able to pound his fist with sufficient vigour to move towards a decisive outcome against Hamas. Benjamin, Israel has said repeatedly it doesn't want to occupy Gaza, and I think many people would believe that. Uh, but even if victory is declared over Hamas, uh, how can Israel be sure that another group just doesn't pop up? Uh, in fact, even in the West Bank, Fatah and a lot of supporters there you know, have, have been saying that they would back Hamas. Uh, so it, it, it seems like just getting rid of Hamas, even if that happens, that's not enough. I think you're absolutely right. Israel in the past has been saying that it does not want to retake the Gaza Strip. It does not want to remain inside the Gaza Strip. But of course, that was prior to the events that took place on Saturday morning, October the 7th. Those events have shaken Israeli society to its core. It has brought about very real questions that I assure you will be asked of our entire defense establishment and our leadership going all the way up to Prime Minister Netanyahu. Now's not the time to delve into those recriminations that surely await, but the mindset has shifted. The mindset is that this is a presence there, Hamas, in the Gaza Strip that cannot be permitted to rearm. Now, how that might turn out? Well, it could be anything from a full military reoccupation of the Gaza Strip. That's something that certainly is being talked about, but it's not something that's met with a very enthusiastic appetite for reasons that you well understand. And we could see some sort of arrangement whereby the Israelis move in, the IDF moves in, disarms Hamas, and then holds strategic areas to prevent the rearming of Hamas, such as the Rafiah crossing, the Rafah crossing right. down there okay. alongside you. That's possible. Yeah. Just uh, quickly, Benjamin, we have a uh, unity government, a unity war cabinet in Israel at the moment. Uh, how long can that survive? Well, that's a very interesting question. I don't think that that will survive for very long at all. If I can be frank about it, I think that you're going to see Prime Minister Netanyahu and the Chief of Staff and the upper echelons of the entire security establishment perhaps fight and fight with regard to combating Hamas as though this is indeed their last fight atop the leadership of Israel, because quite frankly, I believe it is. When you ask me how long the unity government will last, I would imagine until the recrimination, the inevitable recrimination starts here in Israel and people start moving to yeah. have Netanyahu move aside. 
This is Bloomberg Daybreak Asia, your morning brief on the stories making news from Hong Kong to Singapore and Wall Street. Look for us on your podcast feed every day on Apple, Spotify, and anywhere else you get your podcasts. You can also listen live each day on Bloomberg 1130 in New York, Bloomberg 991 in Washington, Bloomberg 1061 in Boston, and Bloomberg 960 in San Francisco. Our flagship New York station is also available on your Amazon Alexa devices. Just say, Alexa, play Bloomberg 1130. Plus, listen coast to coast on the Bloomberg Business app, Sirius XM Channel 119, the iHeartRadio app, and on Bloomberg.com. I'm Brian Curtis. And I'm Doug Krisner. Join us again tomorrow for all the news you need to start your day right here on Bloomberg Daybreak Asia.